Hey there, welcome back to another weekly wrap up or finally after, I don't know, three weeks or something like that. Essentially all of November so far is what we're going to be covering today because I realized that I only have what, like one more week next week's Thanksgiving, which is the end of the month. And by the time I do a weekly wrap up next week, it'll essentially be a monthly wrap up. So I want to get one out and done. So my monthly wrap up is not ridiculously long. <laughs> so weekly wrap up, essentially catching up for all of November so far. And surprisingly, despite um, how obsessed I've been with the, the book I'm currently reading, I don't have a single physical book out of this entire thing somehow. So I've got my list on my iPad um, and we'll go through it. So um, let's just get started. All right, first I'm kind of gonna group these all together. This is the Innkeeper Chronicles books uh, two, is it two? three, four, no, three, four, and 3.5 or 4.5, depending on whatever list I was looking at. So this is One Fell Sweep, which is book three, um, Sweep With Me, which is 3.5, and Sweep of the Blade, which is book four. So this is the Innkeeper Chronicles. It's essentially an urban fantasy paranormal romance series. I would say more urban fantasy because the romance is not a really big part of things Kind of, sort of, but it's one where all of the typical urban fantasy creatures are actually aliens. So vampires are from a different planet. Werewolves originated on a different planet. Um, and there's just a bunch of different alien species that show up and our main character, Dina, is an innkeeper and inns on Earth are basically neutral territory. And there's also magic because the inns are magic in a way and the innkeepers are tied to the inns magic. So Dina is essentially all powerful when she's on the grounds of the inn because she's tied to the inns magic. And so lots of creatures will come to the inns to um, do uh, peace summits or come to the inns to stay for whatever reason. And there's also uh, times where um, creatures will come and Dina is protecting someone in the inn because accepting someone as a guest is uh, super important to inns and innkeepers. So book three, which kind of, as I saw, I didn't really pay attention to when these books were being released and everything. So book three is essentially the end of a trilogy, it feels like. It wraps up a lot of stuff in terms of Dina and Sean's relationship. Um, it introduces Dina's sister, and who is pretty awesome, and niece. And it like really, um, I don't know what to say without spoiling it. it. Essentially, it really digs into the height of Dina's powers and the largest sort of threat the inn has faced this entire time. So it was very good. I actually really liked it. I was kind of like, you know, lukewarm to enjoying the first two, but I knew like the bones of what was, what was here I really liked and it all coalesced into something I really liked in book three. I still am not sure about Dina and Sean's relationship. I'm happy for them. Like I love that they love each other, but I don't really, I never really understood between book one and two where the love came from. Um, but it's, it's urban fantasy with, you got to get some romance in there. And I really liked the introduction of Dina's sister. I am blanking on her name. I think it's Maeve. And no, it's not Maeve. Maud? Something like that. And so Dina's sister in the past went off to marry a vampire, become a vampire wife, and she has a baby who is half human, half vampire. Okay, a child. And the child is amazing. She is a little feral, and I, I love her. And so while Dina is with Sean, Dina's sister falls for um, the vampire whose name I'm blanking on. This <laughs> November has been a very long month for me. Stressful because of work. So a lot of this I'm blanking on. Um, but and I'm never the best at character names anyways. But their like growth and everything they're going through, which goes into book four, which is actually focuses on her sister. And they go off to um, the vampire planet. That was really cool. And the difference between Dina and her sister. Dina is not your typical urban fantasy heroine. She is strong in terms of like the magic when she's on the inn. But she's not like a out and out badass. A lot of what makes her strong is very internal. It's her her um, morals and what she stands by and how she believes she should treat people 
and her power comes out and like you we only see it in trickles and as the books move along we see like the growth of what to like the max of what her power can be whereas her sister feels like a more typical urban fantasy heroine where she is badass she's a great fighter she's stoic she will do anything to protect her daughter like it feels a lot more typical so that felt a lot more of a typical like badass um urban fantasy story um when we get to her story but I really liked it and then the novella in between 3.5 is it was a really sweet novella where there's like um it's like an innkeeper holiday called the treaty stay and depending on like uh, who is there like it's just there's rules you know it's hard to explain without going into the entire mythos of this world but it was just it's a really nice novella there were small to b big issues that Dina had to deal with all within the span of like two days and it was just it was nice I wish it had gone on because it kind of ends and I was like oh I wanted it to be a longer novel versus just the novella it is but I enjoyed it. So I am really enjoying Innkeeper Chronicles. I think there's maybe one more book that I have to read. Maybe? So, um, but I've, I've been enjoying it. I've really been enjoying it. And I'm glad that it is here. Um, I am running out of, no, I'm not running out of Lona Andrews things. There's a, there's like two other series or something that I can dig into. There's the new um, Kate Daniels, the Wilmington Year stuff that's coming out that I haven't touched yet because I want to build up and have a lot to go through. So um, I continue on my Ilona Andrews read and essentially they've become like a favorite author, but like period, they're just a favorite now overall. So um, that was three, two novels, one novella, all in the Innkeeper Chronicles that I read at the beginning of the month. Next, I read Oshinoko Volume 3 by Aka Akasaka. This is, I don't know if you like anime, you probably know the anime was a big hit. Was it last year? I read the first two volumes earlier this year, maybe last year. Very interesting. So this is sort of, mm, how to describe it? Essentially, there is this idol, I. She is like a star. She has this charisma and there are two people who idolize her um this doctor and his young child patient the the young child patient dies and the doctor is eventually murdered um because he is actually treating i for her pregnancy so it turns out and this is not huge spoilers this happens in the first volume this is the setup for what is going on and essentially the doctor and the young girl um, fan um, are both reincarnated as I's twin children, but they don't know that the other has been reincarnated. So they both think they're the only one living through this weird reincarnated life. And then when they're babies um, or when they're young children, I is also is murdered. So they the this volume three jumps to when they're when they the twins are teenagers and they're starting out in their truly like trying to make a name for themselves in uh, career in their careers in the spotlight and volume three focuses heavily on um aqua the brother aqua's um life on this like reality show like teen dating reality show and i don't quite know how i feel about this like i kind of understand why this whole thing is about this reality show and all the characters on it and the friendships and stuff going on but it also feels kind of superfluous like all of this just to get like this friendship group or at least this one uh, person and woven into it it was doing a lot of theming on um online bullying of celebrities or minor celebrities whoever they are and i understand why this was all done but i think without going further into the series yet this feels like a, why was this an entire volume kind of thing so I am going to continue because I am very intrigued by the series, but I'm kind of on thin ice with this so far. So we'll see where we go. I love the first two volumes. It was crazy. <laughs> it was like real crazy kind of situation and setup. So this is kind of coasted, but I really want it to continue and really get going. So um, I will continue on at some point. Next is the book that kicked off my current reading obsession. That is Two Like the Lightning by Ada Palmer. Oh, okay. So I've had the ebook 
for this for a very long time. It goes on sale constantly. So at some point when it was like $2, I bought it. And I have tried to read this book for many years and I kept bouncing off of it. So I think I gave it a really good try, maybe at least three times. And I would bounce off of it hard. I don't think I ever got past the first chapter, maybe the second chapter. And finally, I was on Libro FM, I had a credit, and I got the audio because Jefferson Mays narrates it. And if you don't know, Jefferson Mays narrates the entire Expanse series. I read almost all of the Expanse on audio with Jefferson Mays. I know he's amazing. I love his narration. So I was like, okay, this is going to be it. If I can't do it on audio with Jefferson freaking Mays, this book is not for me. Thank you, Jefferson Mays, for cracking the code for this for me. Having this on audio and having him narrate it really brought everything to life. It allowed my brain to pierce through the very specific writing style that the author is doing here. So she is doing a sort of 18th century style narration, even though this is set centuries in the future. And at first I was quite confused about why, but as I continued on, and everything just started unfolding and the world started be growing and being filled out, I understood, because a lot of 18th century themes are being used here. And I just, it's so hard to explain what this book and this series is about. So essentially, the, this, the future of our world is essentially a utopia. There are nations, but people don't really go by nation states anymore. There are what are called hives. So there's like um, the Mitsubishi hive, which is like a collective of Asian countries there. And it's not just countries either. A hive can be a way you look at the world. So there is um, the Masons, the humanists who are largely like uh, Olympians and like they always go after sports and human excellence. There are the... Um, um, oh god, the future spacey, the utopians? Are they called the utopians? Oh my god, I, I just, my brain is a scramble right now. Um, there's the hive that are like super into the future and technology and going into space travel. There, So like, it's not just, you know, nation states is a frame of mind. And then on top of it, there are also this concept of a family called a, a bosh, where it's not just, you know, the family you're born into, you create your bosh when you grow up. And so you have these complicated, simple but complicated uh, notions of where you belong and how you grow up and how you're raised and how different people are. And each of these hives all have their own leaders. And so we get into a lot of political theory, political machinations. Um, and then because each hive is a different way of looking at the world, we also get into a lot of um, just philosophical ideals and looking into different philosophies of how we live. And then on top of it, in this future state, um, religion, nobody can speak about religion in groups of two or more. And because of that, because um, they believe religion is one of the main reasons that there were so many wars in the past. But because, um, but, you know, they still understand that people do have um, needs and desires to talk about religion. So there's this type of person called a sensayer, which is basically similar to a priest therapist kind of, who well, you can talk to one-on-one -on -one and talk about a lot of theology and feelings and stuff like that, which is important because one of the main characters is a sensayer. Um, there are, I just, there's so much, there's so much. And so religion is, uh, taboo. And then gender is also, um, their gender is, everything is gender neutral, essentially. And people can be um, perceived as male or female, depending on the types of traits they exude, not their physical bodies. So it's very interesting. Characters are they or he or she, depending on how our main character is visualizing, not just visualizing them, but the frame of reference that this person is exuding um and sometimes even some characters even change like their genders change depending on what is happening in the story or how uh, their 
um, their, their personality, not their personality, just how, ah, it's just so much. I am so terrible at describing this. I knew I was going to have a hard time describing the series, but it just, essentially, um, I'm just going to go with what, um, Angela at Literary Science Alliance says, uh, Literary Science Alliance? Uh, Angela, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. <laughs> um, Angela describes this as you have a utopia and then all of a sudden um, stuff leads to the fact that war is going to break out again. You haven't had war in a couple hundred years. What happens to this utopia? And this is a thought experiment. What happens to this utopia when war is when you're on the brink of war? How would a utopia go to war? How would the utopia that is set up like this even lead to war? What are the reasons for that? How do people try to stop it? How do people try to mitigate it? How are people reacting to it? So that is the main thought experiment with a very incredible, interesting world building. And then on top of it all, there's this child called Bridger who can um, animate toys and bring it to life. So that is a whole other basket of craziness that is being thrown into this. So it's just, it tickles my brain. It's reactivating all of the parts of my brain that I used when I was doing my uh, undergrad in philosophy, which is making me very happy, but it's also a very tough read. It is like, I, I, I can see why I bounced off it in the past. Um, I can see why many people may not like it. I can see why many people love it. If you want something incredibly interesting, you want something unique, there's just, and um, I think I've seen uh, people describe this as daring and I agreed. This is a daring world that Ada Palmer has created. Like, I can't believe just what she has put down on paper so far. And I am only one and a half books into the series out of four books. So um, I just, I cannot praise this enough. I am enjoying it. I am loving it, but it's so hard to talk about. Um, but yeah, so uh, Two Like the Lightning, I read... I am halfway through Seven Surrenders. I'm probably going to finish the series by the end of the year. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, I, I wish I could talk about it more. I I love it. It's the audacity, the daring, the just everything that is happening in the series. It just is tickling my brain the right way. And I just can't get enough of it. Even though there are days where I'm just like, I really can't be in this right now. I don't have the brain power to be in this right now. When I do read it, I'm just like, yes. Yes, I just, I love everything that is happening here. So, uh, they, uh, yeah, too like the lightning. I am so glad that I finally got into this. After that, um, I kind of need very low-key, easier books to read. Um, so the next thing I read, and I actually read this because I have an ARC and it's coming out in J January. So this is Adrift in Currents, Clean and Clear. This is Wayward Children number 10 by Seanan McGuire. Um, if you know the Wayward Children novella series, um, you know what the series is about. If you don't, this is a series um, about what happens after kids who go to a portal world like Narnia come back to the real world. The aftermath of that. That is the basic premise for this. And the entire series, as it goes along, it explores the different types of worlds that these characters go to, how it affects all these different types of characters in different ways. Book 10, this is Nadia's story. We meet her at, earlier in the series. And she goes to a drowned world, essentially. Nadia, uh, this book has really great disability representation. Nadia is missing um, half her, one of her arms. And it just, it's really fantastic. What the book is doing is really fantastic. Now, I, I have to remind myself that the way this series is being written, Maguire, Shannon is writing this kind of like fairy tales. So fairy tales essentially don't need to be like a, cohesive, perfect follow through series every single book. And she's never done that. She has always had books that are single person, only them going to their world and coming back kind of books. But she does also have books that are pushing forward the narrative of the, the whole entire world as a whole, like all the kids who are who have come back, you know, stuff like that. So this is a book where it is just a character book. It is one character going to her world and how, you know, her history and that. So in regards to whether we needed this book, I don't think it's really whether we need a book in this series. I think it's just like what Shannon wants to write. And she wanted to write Nadia's story. Now, 
I am one of many who are clamoring for Cade's story. So every book that comes out that isn't Cade's story is, is not, you know, perfect for me. But for what this is doing, for this being a fairy tale series, it's a great entry. Um, do I, did I really need Nadia's story? No, but it, it's still a great entry. And this also reminds me of just how the basic premise of books like this, where it's the character story of their world and when they came back, just their basic premise is sad and tra tragic because they go to a world where they find themselves and they're accepted as who they are and they grow and then eventually they get spit back out into our world and have to deal with that. Like, I always forget that that basic underlying premise is there and it's just tragic <laughs> um but yeah a great entry into the series if you like the series um this will be out in january and thanks to netgalley and tour.com for um approving my arc request lastly um unfortunately i am not going to talk about these books because they are part of a project and if you if you are ashley you've already figured out this project so i read extinction by douglas preston and baby x by kira Peacock. If you can figure it out, you figured it out. If not, um, you will see that video when it comes out. So I'm not going to talk about them here because I want to talk about them in a separate video. So, but I wanted to put them here and let you know that those were also read both on audio. So yeah, that is everything I've read in November so far. I anticipate quite a couple more books in the next week and a half that we have left. That'll do it. It's been a weird reading month. Not quite. Yeah, it's just been weird. Very uneven, very strange. Like, I've enjoyed what I'm reading, but other than Two Like the Lightning, you know what? I think it's Two Like the Lightning and the Tarag Notice series. It's just kind of like overshadowing everything else because I'm just enjoying it so much. So it's very, very strange reading month. So we'll see how the rest of it goes. As always, thank you for watching. If you'd like to leave a emoji, how about a turtle for Adrift and Currents Clean and Clear? And I will catch you next time. Bye.